We're going to start out with a song that you guys know called Your Grace is Enough. And I love this song because no matter what, if everything falls away, his grace really is enough for us. So let's sing. Why did you have to say that? <laughs> Why did you have to say that? It's all love, brother. <laughs> I'll tell you, okay, okay, you get one brief story. Happy Father's Day to all those who deserve it. But um, one of my daughters came home from, uh, from Boise, she's an audiologist, and I get chastised for not having hearing aids in, because I got hearing aids through the VA, and I never wear them. But I put them on. My wife didn't know this. this it was her birthday two days ago. She didn't know Sam was coming home. Anyway, long story short, I put the hearing aids in. Sue's wondering why I got the hearing aids in. Sammy comes home and sees I got the hearing aids in. She said, Dad, that's so good. You got your hearing aids in. And she says, let me see them. I need to clean them. One didn't have a battery. <laughs> and the other battery was dead. <laughs> so... So I got the one with one good battery. I think it's one good battery. Yeah. <laughs> Two's too powerful. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. All right. So we got a lot of things happening here at Tahoe Community. Uh, on my heart is uh, Vacation Bible School, which will start on July 13th, July 17th. You know, I think of the message and all this that we digest and everything we learn, the music, the worship, the message we'll have in the sermon is to bring people in. That's our calling. That's all of us. 
And so let's reach out to our communities and parents that have children and invite them. Let's get the word out there because it's an awesome, awesome way to bring them in. And what happens a lot of times, you get the child in, you'll gather the parents. You know, you don't save them. It's nothing to do with that. You're just commanded to give them the story and the message, and that's what BBS is about. So that's July 13th, July 17th. We still need people? Okay, we need volunteers. And as I stated, it's a great, great learning experience for adults. Just jump in the water. Jackie will teach you how to swim. <laughs> okay. For what? We'll get them. We'll get them, Carol. We'll get them. Bible study's going. It was awesome. Nine o'clock this morning. Uh, we're uh, light in action, but heavy in heart and knowledge. So that's 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 a key. Uh, I wanted to let you also so know there's no coffee back here. And the new norm is, I, we're not going to have coffee there, but I did make it in the, uh, in the multi-purpose room. i got to remember the changes in all these names. Uh, men's Bible study, Wednesday at 7. Uh, prayer gathering after that, and everybody is welcome to the prayer gathering afterwards. That usually starts about 8.30, 8, 8.30 or so. And the knitting group, where's Kathleen? Is she here? She had to leave. Well, she had to go knit. Okay, so they're knitting. Uh, praise team practice at three. I like this. I can actually read this. Um, life groups are back on, and we have. To, it's, are we doing uh, the comments tonight at seven? Comments tonight at seven. Be there. It's an awesome time of worship and outreach. It was awesome. Bob shared a story about uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter. They were doing a. Uh, uh, protest here, I'll share this with you because I happened to run into a young man from Maryland and he said to me, he said uh, uh, if you believe in equality, let me know and I said, I believe in equality and he, said, he had under that BLM and I said to him, you know, around here in Nevada we protest against BLM and he looked at me and I said, Bureau of Land Management they're trying to take over <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he kind of got it he, did, he was from Maryland, he'd never heard that All right, my verse for the day, and this is probably being read in every church in North America. It comes from Deuteronomy, and it's Deuteronomy uh, 5.16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land with which the Lord your God has given you. And that's to all of us. I mean, it goes short. Life, life passes quickly, and we're living for one thing, eternity. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this gathering, Lord God. I thank you for the freedom we have. Lord, as there's bumps ahead, uh, we're, we've experienced it with COVID. We've experienced with our own uh, uh, things going on domestically, Lord God. We seem to be a nation divided. But I realize, and everybody in this room realizes, you have a plan in this, Lord God, and it will unfold. Lord, be with uh, Mondo and the rest of this worship team as we uh, continue in our service. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. If you guys would stand, we'll continue with worship.
So this next song that we're gonna sing is actually a new song, somewhat of a new song. And we're gonna be singing about our identity in Christ in this song. And I think sometimes um, throughout our walks we can hear the lies of the enemy telling us things that we're not. And in this song, we're gonna be singing out what we know that we are in Christ. And I wanted to read 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Let's sing.
Worship team, it's awesome, and uh, how Ali gives a, the history of what she's saying and what it means that the realness of this, and for all of us to be here, it's just incredible. And it's by God's design, everything that takes place, everything that lies ahead is by God's design. This is a time where we come in offering, and you will have a basket set up in the back, and then also you can do it online as well, and it's in your program. So Whatever works is working for us. Remember, it's in the opening song, Saved by Grace. It's by grace we are saved. There's nothing we can do. 
above that. That's where we are. And we're out here in the mission field and we're serving. We'll look at VBS and the things that we have going on. This church does an awesome job. I thank you for your offerings. Will you join me in prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity we have as part of the worship service, Lord God, to bring, <clears throat> to bring our offerings to you, Lord God, and to see them put into use. It's just, it's just amazing, Lord, that we have this, uh, this time that we can see in so many things. In a, in, a, in a body that seems so small sometimes, so much is being done, Lord God. And there's so many gifts we have amongst our body that are being used on a daily basis, Lord God, all the time. Lord, we just thank you again for this gathering. And we pray for Mondo as he delivers our message. These things we ask in your name. Amen. myself. <laughs> Can't blame anybody for that. <laughs> That's right. <so. laughs> All right. Galatians chapter 2. We've been going through this book and uh, today we're going to kind of jump around a little bit because as we know the idea of the gospel, we've been talking about the book of Galatians being the, the nature of the gospel, understanding the nature of the gospel. And we've also been discussing how um, narrow the gospel is. The songs today uh, were extremely appropriate. You know, we don't, we want you to believe that we get together and we plan all these things very you know, methodically, but in reality, we don't. And uh, it's, I find it fascinating that Ted and I used to talk about this all the time as well, that just how the song selection is evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in picking the songs out and matching up with where we're going to be. And the two songs that stick out in my mind is certainly that we are here by grace. And uh, the gospel is one that is good news. We put our faith and trust in Jesus alone by faith and grace plus what? Nothing. Nothing. And yet here we are as well in, you know, even the song, the new song that we sang about having our identity in Christ. What, what we see happening, or at least here in the, in the, in the as soon as the gospel was, was given by Jesus and then uh, Paul or uh, Peter going out and preaching, it didn't take long before mankind, not just men, but mankind coming and saying, yeah, 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 but we want to add something to that. We, we, belief in Jesus, good thing, but Jesus plus this. And so what, what, if you look on your sheet, I've given you some, a lot of information today. Turn over the, the back side of your sheet. And you'll see, well, we want to see something here as it relates to the, the formative years of Paul. Because that's, you know, Paul's writing the book of Galatians. And you see some of this history here of how Paul was given, I think, the, um, the fullness of the gospel that wasn't necessarily yet given over to Peter and them. And the title of today's message is The Freedom and Independence of the Gospel, where last week we see that Paul was discussing the power and the independence of the gospel. But as, as it relates to some background here, you know, uh, Peter goes out in Acts chapter 2, preaches the gospel to the Jewish people. And that's great. They, a lot of them receive it, and they begin to put their trust and faith in Jesus. But what we do know is... What did the, those early disciples, what did they do every day or during, you know what I mean? I kind of have a dumb question, I'm sorry. I like to ask questions. I'm used to Sunday school. What did they do? They'd go out and preach and they'd go to the temple, right? So there's the temple. They'd go and they would gather around. They'd eat bread. They'd pray. They would teach. And they were gathering in the temple. And there's the temple. And there's the sacrifices going on. And this happened for several years. And... And you think for them, nothing really changed except what? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we do see is that many of them still went and participated in the festivals. 
They participated in the Old Testament law um, things because that's, there it is, the temple's there. This has been their tradition for at least 500 and some years with this temple. But they're out there preaching Jesus. And they weren't necessarily going out into the world preaching the gospel to Gentiles, right? So several years later, we saw that they decided, well, God began to do a work in Acts chapter 8 with the Samaritans. And they're kind of half Jews, so we will allow that. So there's, there's, what, there's these things that are happening in Jerusalem. And then with Acts chapter 8, Peter gets stoned. He gets killed in Acts chapter 7. And then in Acts chapter 8, a persecution arises, which causes a lot of the early church to spread out. It's interesting how God does things, right? They're there hunkering down. God says, no, we're going to take this out. We're going to spread the word. So he causes some persecution, and they, as they spread out to avoid the persecution by the, the temple authorities and the Sadducees in Jerusalem, they, they spread out, and they go, go to Samaria, they go to other parts. But that took a few years. But within that few years, simultaneously, as we saw last time in Acts chapter 9, there's this guy Saul who ends up getting confronted by Jesus on his way to Damascus, which is modern-day Damascus, still there continually occupied. It's pretty amazing. And he gets confronted by Jesus on the road, and Jesus says, hey, you're going to be an apostle for me. And so, number two there, I'll just, you can go through this. He gets confronted, but then what Paul immediately begins to do is to go out and preach the gospel. This good news that he hears about, that, that Jesus has re, um, communicated to him, and he's teaching it to everybody. Well, then after three years, he decides, well, you know what? I, I used to be in Jerusalem, and I know that there's some, you know, the, 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 the big dogs there. Peter, James, John, right, those guys. But he's out there preaching. He didn't immediately go talk to any of them. He just says, you know what? You know who my authority is? My authority is Jesus. He showed up to me. He, he communicated me the gospel, and I've been preaching it now for several years. But I'm going to go up there and talk to these guys. That's number three. And then certainly he shows up and they're a little nervous about him. Well, this is the guy that used to take us and persecute us and, cause, and obviously was responsible for Stephen's death. He stays there for a couple weeks and then he, and he gets the word here in let 3C there. The Hellenistic Jews attempt to kill Paul. Now, Sunday school people, Hellenistic. What does that mean again? Greek. Greek. These are the Greek Jewish people. These are the Jewish people that were living there that spoke Greek, and they try to kill Paul. Well, then he leaves, number four, to go to Tarsus, which is where he was from originally. And they go there, and he's kind of on his own, and Tarsus is not Israel. So what's he doing? He can't shut Paul up. He's preaching the gospel to these non-Jews. Hey, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. And for him, he understands that these guys are up there, the temple's down in Jerusalem, that they're saved by faith. They didn't need to follow the Old Testament law. He didn't bring that with him. But because God was doing such a great work amongst him there, it drew, it drew the attention of the Jerusalem church. And it drew, drew the attention of others that, as we saw, well, you could see, keep going in Acts 15, these Pharisees that had become believers, and they're like, Hey, we hear about this guy, Paul, going out to preaching the gospel. Well, we need to go down there and make sure that he's preaching the correct gospel. For them, it was belief in Jesus plus following the Old Testament laws. And so when they come down there, and here in, in number five there, there's persecution. They return. They're doing ministry. And Paul is doing ministry there, and he decides... Hey, let's bring some, let's bring some uh, relief, some famine, some generosity. So he collected an offering and said, well, we're going to go back to Jerusalem and we're going to give it to the saints there because there was a famine in the land. And that's where you see uh, here him going in, in Acts, and it really appears, I'm trying to think of where, Acts like 11. He comes back and he shows up and this was his second visit, which we'll read in a minute, 14 years later. So 14 minus 3 is what? 11. Jeff's on it. 11 years later, he goes back to Jerusalem. So 
as he's there, he's talking, and they start asking him, Paul, what have you been doing? He goes, well, I've been preaching this gospel of good news, this gospel of grace, this gospel of faith. Well, what we know is Paul has already been doing that from basically Acts 9 for 14 years. That's important because he comes back to Jerusalem in Acts 11. Well, what happened in Acts chapter 10? I'm trying to give you the background here so you'll follow when we get into the text. God shows up to Peter in Acts chapter 10, which was many years, probably maybe 10 years, 8 to 10 years after the gospel first was given by Peter in chapter 2. And he says, remember, he gives him the vision. He gives him this vision of this sheep that comes down of having all these unclean animals, pigs, shrimp, you know, you name it, all the things that we eat, okay, and uh, bacon and everything. And God shows up to Peter and says, Peter, I want you to eat. Peter says, man, I've never eaten anything that's non-kosher. And God says, don't you dare call unclean what I have declared to be clean. And the most basic level of Judaism, the most daily thing in Judaism, is what you eat. And they had very special rules to keep them separate. And what God was revealing to, to Peter was, I'm doing something and those laws that you had under the old covenants are no longer applicable. But here, here's the thing. It took God 10 years to finally explain it to Peter. It took him immediately to share it with Paul. And Paul had already been out there. That's, this is important. Paul had already been out there preaching this gospel of grace because he's out where in Jerusalem, the temple's there, and it's not that God uh, didn't intend that. He just took his time because he knew that, what, what's the definition of, of a definite Jewish person in the Bible? What are they called? Stiff-necked. That's God said, not us. Okay, we're not, this isn't a racial slur. God calls them stiff-necked. And he knew that they would be slow to understand the, the transition that God was doing. And we know that they were because after this happens in Acts chapter 10, Paul or Peter goes up to visit Cornelius, who's this Gentile guy. Afterwards, he comes back in Acts chapter 11. Paul had come into town. Peter's like, Peter gets confronted by his Jewish brethren. What were you doing with that Gentile? They had a hard time. And Peter says, hey, look, you need to back off. I went there because an angel told me to go there. God told me to go there. And then an angel showed up to Ananias, or um, Cornelius, this guy in Acts chapter 10. And he goes, he goes, hey man, what, why are you calling for me? And Cornelius says, an angel told me to call for you. He says, well, I usually don't hang out with Gentiles. This, this is non-kosher right here. So Cornelius says, all I know is that I fear God and the angel told me to call for you because you're going to give me the full message. And so he presents the message of Jesus to him. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes down to all of them. They start speaking in other languages. Just like what? Acts chapter 2, 10 years earlier. So when Peter comes back, all, all this is coinciding at once. Paul's coming into town with his relief offering. And now Peter has been introduced to the gospel going to the Gentiles and his, his, his Judaizing friends come and say, what were you doing over there? And that's when he says, hey, look. Remember how the, the Holy Spirit came on us way back when? The Holy Spirit came on them in the same way. Who am I to tell God what to do? If God wants to save these Gentiles in the same manner as us by faith, I can't stand in his way. So with that as a backdrop, we, we jump in here to um, Galatians chapter 2. And what Paul has been doing is Paul comes in right about Acts 11, right? He comes in Jerusalem. But at that same time, as he leaves Galatia, the southern part of, of what is modern day Turkey, some other Judaizers had come in behind him. And he heard that they were coming in telling these Galatians who understood the gospel of being saved by grace plus nothing. 
hey, you need to keep the law. God is not uh, pleased with you. It's great that you believe in Jesus. That's a great start. But unless you add this in, you cannot receive full fellowship into God's family. Now, what I want to do today is all of us, again, we've said this before, all of us as Christians, eventually we're going to wonder, what do we do with the Old Testament Mosaic Covenant? What do we do with it? Are we supposed to follow or not? And I want to put it to rest. Okay? Because the question is, is there are those that say, yes, we believe, yeah, believe in Jesus is great, but you should be observing Passover. You should be eating kosher. You should be uh, exalting up the Old Testament festivals. We don't, you know, and, and, and it sounds really spiritual. Well, so you're one of the ones that just throws out the Bible, huh? You're one of those that unhitch from the Old Testament. That's poor language, okay? The question for us is, do we follow the 613 Mosaic laws? And if we don't, why not? That's what was happening. And it, not only that, but it goes back to Genesis 17, when God instituted circumcision for Abraham and his descendants, as well as anybody that was a Gentile. If you were a Gentile servant in Abraham's house, you had to be circumcised. So what... One of the biggest uh, examples of the Mosaic system is circumcision. And so they were coming and they were teaching the Galatians, hey, it's great that you believe in Jesus, but you will never be accepted by God unless you become circumcised. And with your circumcision comes all the rest of your requirement to follow the Old Testament system. And now, now let's think of it this way. It was a little bit easier for them to get away with it. Why? Well, because the temple's still there. You know, we're talking roughly 45, 48 A.D. here. And so they're going, oh, wow, I live up here in Tarsus. So if I read the Old Testament, it's telling me I need to go three times a year to Jerusalem. That's kind of a long trip. So you're telling me I need to go there? And Paul says, no, you don't. But the Judaizers went in behind him and said, you do need to do this. Well, then Paul now is in Jerusalem. And he's given, bringing this offering. And he hears about this, and then he writes back this book to the Galatians while he's in Jerusalem. And that's what we're seeing here. So let's jump into Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, he, he, the, well, let's go 18 for the sake of context. Galatians 1, 18. He says, after three years, his conversion, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, I'm not lying. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which is up uh, out of Israel. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Then... After 14 years, roughly 48 A.D., I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, but I also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. What he's saying here is he's writing to the Galatians, and the Judaizers that were coming into town were saying... Paul doesn't preach the true gospel. In fact, he um, has distorted the gospel that he got from uh, James, John, and Peter. And what Paul is saying is, hold on a minute. I didn't confer with anybody. I got this gospel directly from Jesus himself. And what you see him keep saying here is these men of reputation. And it's not that Paul is against Peter and those guys, but what he'll say is, I don't care who's who. I got this directly from Jesus, and as he said in chapter 1, I don't care if an angel from heaven comes to you, if he preaches a different, different gospel, the one that I received from Jesus, and the one I've given to you, let them be accursed. What he's declaring to the Galatians is the independence of his gospel, and he's trying to say, I didn't go to them, and first of all, I don't care what they say. 
In fact, if they have a different gospel than me, then we're going to have words. But what he says, he makes this comment that I hope that they'll confirm the gospel that I have. Because otherwise, if I don't, it's going to cause a lot of trouble. Because he's already been preaching it for 10 years. Lest I run in vain. But what you see Paul here is Paul doesn't back down. He goes on to say about verse 3, Titus. Yet not even Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So he goes, I went back up to Jerusalem after 14 years. I brought Titus with me, who's a Greek. And I didn't circumcise him at all. Because the truth of the gospel is, the gospel is the good news of faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. And this occurred because of false brethren, verse 4, secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now I want us to do something here. It's a couple things. So we're going to see two things. The power of the gospel is in its freedom and also again reminding us that it's in its independence. The freedom of the gospel was confirmed by revelation. He said... Hey, the reason that I went back up to Jerusalem after 14 years wasn't because I was looking to get validated by anybody. I went up there because he had the offering. I have there Acts 9 through 11. He said, but I went up there to bring my offering, but secondly, because God told me to go up there. And it was perfect timing for him to go up there and share this. The freedom of the gospel avoids the trap of law bondage. Now, Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. So on your green sheet there, under background text, we're going to cover these for a moment because I want you to tell me if Hebrews chapter 7, if I'm, I'm going to be very argumentative here, okay? Just deal, just deal with it. Because what, what's at stake here is the gospel itself. And what Paul said is these, these false brethren, think about this. Anybody that is going to promote Jesus plus something else is a false brother worthy of eternal hellfire. That's pretty serious. And it helps us to understand, to go, how committed was Paul to this gospel? Enough to pronounce judgment on anybody by inspiration that wouldn't agree with it. And so for us, we, we come to this place and, and it, it's, it's completely applicable because, especially now, Christians and those that are willing to stay true to the biblical gospel are not welcome in this arena of ideas. Especially if you get into some of the secular universities or, man, just try, I, I don't recommend this, but maybe facetiously. I dare you to go on social media and just put out there, Jesus is the only way, and if you don't believe in him, you're going to burn in hell forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> and did you get loved? Yeah. <laughs> See, what, what, what this puts on us is, and again, we want to be wise. I'm not saying that's the way to do it. But we're, all of us are going to come to that point of whether, whether it's friends, social media, or just in around us, are we committed to this gospel? This gospel is the good news. It's wonderful. It's the wonderful news that Jesus died for us. And that by putting our faith and trust in him, man, we can have our identity in Christ. We go, oh, this is freedom. The opposite of this is what Paul says is bondage, slavery. And you go, what? But in Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to see a couple things. I want to go through these. He's writing to the Jewish people. Makes sense? Hey guys, I'm, I've been telling you about Jesus the Messiah, and, and he says this in, in verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were, was through the Levitical priesthood, all those Old Testament laws and sacrifices, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? 
and not according to the order of Aaron. What he's saying here, without getting all the details, is the Old Testament system, you had Aaron and his priests. Under the New Covenant, we got Jesus. And Jesus came to offer the final sacrifice. Verse 12. If the priesthood changed, of necessity there also is a change of the law. Is that unclear? That there's a change from that old covenant mosaic Aaronic system now to Jesus. Because he goes on to say, For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident, verse 14, that our Lord rose from Judah, the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Look at verse 18. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. What does annul mean? Canceled. It depends on the version. That what they're saying is, it's not that the Mosaic law was bad. Romans 7, 12 says it was righteous, good, and holy. But it did not accomplish what we would hope it accomplished, which is perfection. And then when you go to Hebrews chapter 10, he says in verse 4, don't you know that the blood of bulls and goats cannot provide perfection? And then in 14, he says, for by one offering, we have been perfected forever by that offering that Jesus did. So what we have here is there's a change of the law. And then the old law has been annulled. It's done. It is gone. Now, there are many that say, no, 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 no. We don't just throw it out. Well, the word annulled is pretty strong. It's like it has no bearing, has no authority. It's been changed. And so what we, what we do see is in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul makes this comment to say that I'm not under the law of Moses anymore. I'm under the law of Christ. So we have Moses who is esteemed, which includes circumcision. He says, we're not under that. I'm under the law of Christ now. And later in the book of Galatians, we'll get to it. He says, if you think you need to be circumcised, then you might as well give up Jesus. You cannot have both. If you trust that keeping some sort of laws is going to gain you favor, then you have to get rid of Jesus. And so what, when, you, when, when these people that teach this stuff, again, I was a Jewish studies major in my undergrad, and so I, we were learning to deal with some of these, you know, what, it could be a Seventh-day Adventist, it could be a Messianic Jewish person who wants you to follow the kosher laws and other things, and it's in their slippery. And you talk to him and you go, you think I need to follow the, the Mosaic system? Well, yeah. What does it gain me? Are you saying that Jesus isn't, isn't enough? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Well, what are you saying? Well, that God gave the Old Testament laws for a reason and he wants us to follow them. And I go, for what reason? You who are a law keeper, you don't eat your bacon. This guy has Jesus and eats his bacon. Does God look more favorably on the guy that doesn't eat bacon? Kind of. What does that mean? Kind of. And what they, what the slipperiness is, it says, and this is how they'll twist it. Well, are you saying that it's okay to go out and uh, fornicate and to murder? No. It's like that. So are you saying that if I don't, if I eat bacon, it's the equivalent of murdering somebody? Well, no. And, and you start going, so you're telling me you're a law keeper. Oh, yep, I follow the law. Do you go to Jerusalem three times a year? No. Do you tie 23 to 30%? Do you wear mixed clothing? You know, you start asking, no, no, well, those are ceremonials. And then all of a sudden, now they start distancing themselves. Do you offer your sacrifices, you know, every year? No, no, no. So, oh, I see. You get to pick and choose which laws of the Old Covenant that you want to follow. And then they begin to, to carve up the law in, well, God wants to follow these, but then he doesn't want us to go to Jerusalem two times a year because it's spiritual. And you start going, where do you end? What Paul teaches is that the entire law, Mosaic law, 613, it rises 
or remains as a whole unit. You don't keep some and not others. Paul said, again, I'm not under that law. Now, it is true that if, if I go out and murder somebody, this is important. I'm not, I'm not guilty of breaking the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. I'm guilty of breaking the law of Christ and the New Testament. Because all nine of the Old Testament law was brought forth and repeated. But it's interesting, the Sabbath law wasn't. People say, oh, we should be meeting together on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath and Sabbath. Yes, the Sabbath is Saturday. But the, the, the Old Covenant Mosaic system was not given to the world. It was given to Israel under a theocracy. You, I didn't put the verses on here, but it's very clear, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 7. Moses says very clearly, what other nation is there that exists in the world that has been given the, 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 the glory and the covenants and the laws that we have today? We're special. He gave those laws to Israel. They're meant to function in a theocratic nation, but the gospel goes to the world. So let's go to, oh, i got to do them in whatever order I have here. Uh, look at uh, 8.13. Hebrews 8.13. He just gets done quoting the, the, the whole new covenant from Jeremiah 31. And he says in 8.13, well, let's look at 7. This, I wish I could go all day here. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. The Mosaic Covenant had a fault. The fault wasn't with the covenant. Look at what he says. Very important, verse 8. Because finding fault with them. The Old Covenant said this. Here's 613 commandments. If you obey all these perfectly, you get salvation. That's what it said. The fault is not with the law. The law is righteous, good, and holy. But when that system interacts with Mondo, the fault is with me. Because I can't observe all that. And you go, well, how does this help me? It only condemns me. And even the little bit of forgiveness that it gives, according to Hebrews 10, the, the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. In fact, he says, Every year I have to go back and do it. And it just reminds me how simple I am. So that whole system was never meant to bring salvation. But it was meant to point us to something. Every year it would go, kill a, lots of blood, kill an animal, lots of blood, substitute, boom, boom. You do that for 1,500 years. Pretty soon you should get it in your mind. Substitute, substitute, substitute. So that when Jesus comes and dies as my substitute, I'd go, ding, ding, ding. This is what God meant the whole time. All that was a shadow pointing me to Christ. And then in verse 13, he says this, after quoting Jeremiah 31, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When the writer's writing this, what's happening in Jerusalem? The temple's still there. But he says this is going to vanish away. And we know that it did in 70 A.D., and that system, which does not produce real effect, was going out of existence, and we see that. Turn me to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm just going to go through these super quick, because here we have, just review, chapter 7, 11, 12, 18. There's been a change of the law, and the law has become annulled. Ephesians 2 Verse 14, it says, Jesus himself is our peace, who has made both of these groups, Jews and Gentiles, one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that hostility, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, as to create himself one new man. What he's saying is, if in the Old Testament, the thing that separated the Jewish people and their salvation from all the rest of the world was the law. And he says, now when Jesus came, he's broken that all down. He's creating a new group, and he's abolished the law. Now we have change. We have a null. We have obsolete. 
And now we have the word abolish. In order to get into the family of God, into this new body, Paul is saying, Jesus took care of that separation, that wall that was keeping you out. He abolished it. And now, you know how you get in there? By faith. He just got done telling that in verse 8 and 9. You're saved by grace through faith. Not of works. Not of works of the law. Okay? Let's go to um, Galatians 3.19. We're already kind of there. We'll actually, we'll skip that one. It says this. We'll get to it later. Except to say, the law was until Christ. The law lasted, the Old Testament system lasted until Jesus. Okay? Turn to 2 Corinthians 3. We're going to go. I want you to see this because I know this is pretty in, in depth, but I want us to put it to rest because we're going to see this foundation. The question is this. This is tricky. How many of us believe that we should follow the Ten Commandments? Go. What I'm telling you, absolutely not. If you claim to follow the Ten Commandments, then you're, you have to follow the rest of the old covenant laws, all 603 more. Oh, but Mondo, the Ten Commandments are kind of special. But what we recognize is if you truly believe that, what the Fourth Commandment as it relates to the Sabbath, that's part of the Ten, I mean, that's a bit big, Daddy, right? Does it give you the option of, in our work week, we work how many days a week generally? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Seven. Over, we generally work five, do we not? Weekends off? Okay. Under the old covenant, you weren't allowed to work five. You had to work six. Therefore, all you guys, if you take two days off a week, you're pagans. You do not obey the Ten Commandments. You don't obey the fourth one. And we're here on Sunday, which means you're not worshiping on Saturday. You're another pagan. We begin to recognize, well, wait a minute. You know, yeah, okay, but isn't that spiritual? Who gave us the right to spiritually work? That would be nice. There was no, there was no uh, tolerance. In Exodus 35, as an example, in the wintertime, on Saturday, do any of you light a fire? Some people do, right? You're worthy of death. Read Exodus 35. There's a guy out there picking up sticks to light a fire, to, to, to warm the fire for his family. They find him, they take him over. Moses, what do we do? Moses, let me ask God. God says, what do we do with this guy? He's picking up sticks in order to start a fire, in order to cook food and to heat uh, for his family. God says, kill him. He violated my Sabbath. That's one of the ten. See, all of a sudden we go, I'm not, maybe I'm not a Sabbath, maybe I'm not a Ten Commandment guy. <laughs> but we go, well, but honoring your father and mother. What about not murdering, not adultery, not lying? Those are all repeated under the new covenant system. So if I murder somebody, it's not the ten, it's not Moses, I have violated Jesus. And in Jesus' new law, the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2, 1 Corinthians 9, in that system, the Sabbath is not there. So we recognize there's been this distinction. But here, just so you, you I can prove this to you. In chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3, he's talking about the new covenant. He says, um, let's start verse 7, make it quick. If the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, what was engraved on stones? The Ten Commandments. So we're getting to the, the foundation here. He says, what does he call this? A ministry of death. That's not very nice. But again, when an unrighteous person, a sinful person, comes up to the Ten Commandments and says, I'm going to live by those, what happens? What does it bring me? Death. Because I can't do it. And Paul says here, hey guys, let me remind you, he's in the Corinthians, these are all Gentiles. The ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious. It was. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was fading away. 
If that's true, this ministry of death had glory to it so that it made Moses' face shine when he was looking there and receiving the Ten Commandments. He says, if that's true, verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation, the Ten Commandments, had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds that much more in glory. For even what was made glorious, which was the Ten Commandments, had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. That's the New Covenant. For if what is passing away, the Old Covenant, was glorious, what remains is that much more glorious. What he's telling them is, hey, the temple's over there. It's, it's part of that old system, including the Ten Commandments. But just so you guys know, that whole system is fading away. But it had, it had its glory for the time. But what's better, a system that brings you death and condemnation or the system by the Holy Spirit that brings you life and peace and security and rest? There's not a reminder every year that i got to go sacrifice that I'm a sinner. I just go, man, Jesus is awesome. One time shot has secured for me salvation and perfection forever. I don't need to get entangled in all that. It didn't even work in the sense of providing eternal salvation anyway. Go, we can go to Romans 10 really quick. And then we'll make our way. I want you guys to see this. So here again, now we have a change. We have a null. We have obsolete. We have abolish. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, that even the Ten Commandments themselves are passing away. It's a ministry of death. The new covenant, man, that's glorious. That's by the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 10, he, he's speaking about his Jewish brothers. And he says, 10, 10 verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayers to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seek to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What's, what's the synonym for belief? Faith. And he begins to go on and says, Hey, I love my Jewish brothers, but you know what? They were trying to establish their own contribution to the work of salvation by their works in the law. He says, man, if you're going to go that route... Good luck. Because in Galatians 3.10, which we're not there yet, he goes on to say, anybody that wants to follow the law has become a, a, obligated to follow all of it. And to the Romans, he says, Christ is the end of that. If you believe, you are saved. Your status before God in his family is not based on whether you follow a single one of those old covenant systems. And that's why in Galatians later he'll say, if you think you need to get circumcised, then you have just thrown Jesus out. This is the message that Paul was already preaching. So let's go back to the book of Galatians. That's, that's the background. Paul, those are all Pauline writings. Galatians was the first book that he wrote. And as he continued his ministry to these Gentiles and to the Romans and others, he's reminding them, hey guys, I, again, I, I, I look, I'll say this. Were any of those verses unclear? Abolish, that's a strong word, annulled, changing, passing away, becoming obsolete, ministry of death. And you go, but yet... These Judaizers wanted to hold on. They wanted to add something. Jesus plus law keeping. Now, this is what you're going to hear. Yeah, but what about Matthew 5, 17? Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill. And it's interesting there that Ephesians 2 says that Jesus abolished the law. Is this a contradiction? 
They'll say, see? So it's like, okay, so you're asking me to choose one or the other. That you have all of these texts that tell us that the laws have been changed, abolished, annulled, and blah, blah, blah. But yet you're going to pull this one verse out here, Matthew 5, 17, where what Jesus says is, I didn't come to abolish. And here's the flavor. I didn't come to just disregard it for no reason. I came to fulfill it. The law had a purpose. The law came until Christ. That's what Galatians 3.19 says. When Jesus came and lived 33 years of perfection, he fulfilled it perfectly. He didn't come just to willy-nilly remove it without it accomplishing its purpose. It's fascinating to me that the same word there, I didn't come to throw it away haphazardly, I came to fulfill it, is the same word that appears in Matthew chapter 2 where it says that Mary brought forth her firstborn son, right? The virgin conceived and gave birth to a child. That's Isaiah 7.14. And here's my question for you. Isaiah 7.14 is a prophecy of, of a purpose to say there's a woman coming in the future that's going to be an absolute virgin and she's going to get, she's going to have a baby. When Mary comes and she has the baby, what happens to that prophecy? It becomes fulfilled. Do we expect anything more of that? Do we expect it to happen again? The word fulfill means it accomplished what it was meant to do. It's over. It's done. It has been completed. When Jesus came and he said, I didn't come just to take the law and just throw it away. I came to complete it. I came to fulfill it. Theologically, it's beautiful. There's absolutely no contradiction. Jesus came to live the law perfectly on our behalf. Now that's freedom. That is freedom. Now, one more, Acts 15, just really quick, I promise you. I want you to see the language because Paul says, Paul said in Galatians 2, these people, these Judaizers that are coming in behind, they're coming in and they're wanting to spy out our liberty. Who loves liberty, man? I love freedom. That's awesome. They come in and they're coming in and going, well, look at these guys and their freedom. You know what? But they're, they're trying to bring us back into bondage. Acts 15, we'll see this later. Paul writes the book of Galatians. He's there in Acts chapter 11. He goes out and does some more ministry. He comes back a third time to Jerusalem and they have this big conference. Hey, Paul, tell us about your ministry. Man, I've been out there preaching the gospel. God is saving all these Gentiles left and right. And then in Acts 15, look at verse 5. Some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, they were believers, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Paul's like, over my dead body. You guys didn't, must not have read my letter to the Galatians. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by, the, by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God knows, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That's Acts chapter 10. Hey guys, you guys know how a little while ago God gave them the same thing as us. No distinction. Now therefore, verse 10, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Amen, Peter. Peter says, why are you testing God here? If you want to have them, again, this is not a context. Verse 5, it is necessary to circumcise them, that's Genesis 17 and Leviticus 12, and also to command them to keep the law. And Peter gets up and says, why are you testing God here? We couldn't do that. If we tried to use that as an addition to our salvation, it was a massive failure. It was bondage, it was slavery. And people say, well, Acts 15, that's, it's not about keeping the law of Moses. That's exactly what it says. And Peter gets up to say the same thing. That is slavery. 
And then they, got, they finally make a decision and say, nope, the law of Moses don't have to command anybody to keep that. So going deep here, God wants us to embrace the freedom of the gospel. But liberty in Christ, there's three things. We have freedom from contributing to our salvation. Isn't that great? Because if I have a bad day, I don't need to worry, man, did I just lose it? Did I, I'm not feeling spiritual today. I'm not feeling Christian today. I'm not feeling like loving my neighbor to say, today. And God says, you know what, man, I'm really disappointed in you. Does he say that to us? Romans 8, 1, there is now at this present time no condemnation for those that are in Christ. And we say, ah, I can rest. I have freedom from contributing my salvation, from living under the law, and also freedom from the law's curse. The second thing here, a little quicker, the power of the gospel, number one, is found in its freedom, but also in its independence. Notice what Paul says, starting in verse 6 through 10. He's, he's writing to them. He says, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God, verse 6, shows no personal favoritism to anybody. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. He's talking about the Peter, James, and John. He says, look, I didn't get my gospel from them, and I don't care what they say. I got it from Jesus. So even if they were to disagree with me, I don't care. I'm not changing my gospel. I'm glad that they agree. I'm glad that God did a good work, and he brought them alongside to I mean, you can, Paul really, what he could have said is, hey, they're the ones that got it later than me. It took Peter till Acts chapter 10, and he still struggled with it. I got this from the beginning, and I've been out preaching the gospel, and God has been following and saving people from the beginning. But Paul is very kind. But he says, God shows favoritism to nobody. But what the Judaizers come along and said. Paul took the gospel that he got from Peter, James, and John, and then he t distorted it. And he says, I didn't get it from them. Didn't need to. The gospel I got, man, it's straight from Jesus himself, and I'm not backing down, and I'll die for it, and I'll, and I'll go up against an angel from heaven if I need to. If an angel comes to Galatians from heaven and tells you something different, curse him. He says on verse 7, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, which Gentiles, had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised, which is the Jews, was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the Jews also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. And so he's writing, he's writing to these Galatians who are being tricked. These false teachers have come in to say, hey guys, yeah, we believe in Jesus. Isn't it wonderful, Jesus? But you have to be circumcised and you have to keep the Old Testament law in order to gain God's favor. And unfortunately, they believed it. And later, we'll see Paul is pretty harsh with them. The independence of the gospel should bring unity. That's what Ephesians 2 is about to say. That's why for us even now, when we have all these problems, you know, ethnic groups, racism, everything else, we, we don't come in and say, hey, the solution is to try to solve the symptom. We come in and we say, you know what the solution is? It's the gospel. The gospel shows favoritism to no group. And it says, that's why, it, when you go to Israel, what's awesome is the media, the world, they love to stoke division. But you go there, and in Israel, it's the Palestinians against Israel. But when you go to the churches, the solid evangelical churches, Arabs, Jews, Arabs, Jews, sitting together, loving each other, going, yeah. There's no doubt there's injustice in the world, but you know where justice is found? And you know where unity is found? In Jesus Christ. And it brings that unity. Because we recognize and we go, well, you're a sinner just like I'm a sinner. I'm no worse a sinner than you. God doesn't favor you more than he favors me because 
the Jewish person that's sitting there can't say, well, by the way, we're still the chosen people. And you're still here. That's why Ephesians 2 says it's not about Jew and Gentile. It's about the church. The church is this new group. And it's not that God doesn't have a plan for Israel. I still think so and all that. But we, we don't go, man, I wish I was a Jewish person. The best place to be is in the church. Now, just for some application here. What do we, what do we walk away with? It's okay. Lots of theology there. Number one, God takes his time with change. 10 to 15 years between the Ascension and the First Apostolic Council. To me, I was still thinking about this going, why did God take five to eight years to talk to Peter? Because we're all stiff-necked. How long does it take us to, for God to bring change? Does he change us all overnight? No. We need to be gracious with one another. You know, it, it's, it's interesting that I find that the most uncharitable people are often the ones that have been Christians the longest. You get saved and you go, you need to repent. You need to change. What's wrong with you? This is what the Bible says. Just obey. And they're going, well, how long did it take you? <laughs> well, it took me like 10 years or 5 years or 20 years or something to get some of these habits changed. We're continually growing from glory to glory. What it does for us is we, is we say, Sometimes God will, let's, let's take something like, that's, that may be relatively innocent, something like smoking. Sometimes God will take a person and deliver them from smoking overnight. And others, they still struggle with it 30 years later as a Christian. Does smoking make you go to hell? No. Certainly does. Okay. <laughs> Number two, Paul was a man of discipline, courage, and commitment. And I thought, for us, we, or we talk about this you know, with our kids and stuff, and it's like, Ali said to me the other day, Dad, I don't know. I, this idea of being a Christian for another 60 years, it's only going to get worse. You guys had a good generation. And I said, well, I don't even think for me, I could still live another 40 years. I'm 45. The best generation is the one that's leaving right now. <laughs> I think they don't have to see what we have to deal with. In the sense of where it's going, right? If, if we, as we watch the end times unfold, it is not going to be encouraging. Now, we know God's going to get the vindication. God's going to get glory. We know all that. But we're going to have to continually see it get worse and worse and worse. The world get handed over to the Antichrist. And if you get to leave in the next couple of years, man, blessings to you. <laughs> to die is gain, right? But yet, what we do know is that as we see the world crumble around us and get handed over to the dragon, the beast, we talked about this in Revelation 12 this morning, as we see the world get worse and worse, and Jesus said that it's going to get worse and worse at the end, as we see it happens, the question for us is, are we going to be able to make it? Of course we are, because God will give us the grace necessary. In fact, he said, you're the generation I chose to be able to tolerate, just like the first generation that got fed to the lions. Were they any different than us? No. God's grace was sufficient for them. And that we have to watch it get worse and worse. But yet, Paul and that first generation said, man, I will die for this gospel. You are not going to interrupt my commitment. But I thought, there's a phrase that, when I think about it today, again, I think about it and I go, man, I'm a sissy. I hope that I'll be able to stand. And God says, don't need to worry about it. That's not your task today. When you get there at that time, I will give you the grace sufficient. Because it's not about you anyway. Did you think you were going to look into yourself and find the strength? I guess not anymore. Thank you, Lord, for correcting me on that. We look and we say, God says, I will give you the grace. Paul takes time to defend himself when the gospel is at stake. I find it interesting that oftentimes Paul doesn't defend himself. But when the gospel is at stake, it's like, I'm going to defend it all day long. I'll, I'll give everything. Paul respects human authority, but the gospel always comes first. He says, I don't care who they are. These, these Judaizers are always trying to quote Peter, Paul, and, these, and, and you see that in 1 Corinthians 1, where they're going, well, I'm of I'm Peter, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this. He says, who cares? I got this gospel from Jesus. Number five, the culture and the world will always eventually demand that we give up affirming the exclusivity and absoluteness of the gospel. Will we stand strong? That's the question. Is will we get 
when we allow ourselves to get intimidated, when we don't toe the party line or what the world, especially now, now you can't even think. This this cancel culture they're calling it or the thought police. And, and some of us are like, well, I don't want to speak out loud. We get shut down because we're scared of being bullied by not saying the right thing. And granted, there's wisdom in not speaking about certain, certain cultural issues, right? There's wisdom in that. But when it comes to the gospel, we say, sorry, I don't care whether you accept it or believe me or not. This is what the truth is. Now, there's wisdom in not allowing yourselves to get caught up into some of the symptoms, right? Why take a stand on whether you're a conservative or liberal or Democrat? Don't take that stand. That's foolishness. Our kingdom is not of this world, that we should fight for justice and righteousness and all those things and morality. But if you allow yourself to be defined by one of those labels, we've already lost. Because that's what they're trying to do for us. We're followers of Jesus Christ. That's our identity. And when they try to force us into a label, I just say, you know, I don't, that, that's why I get misrepresented at times. It's my own fault. Because a few weeks ago I said, I don't care about politics. Well, somebody came and, and again, I didn't clarify it, I meant I won't be defined by politics. Because my brother, he wants to define me as a whatever in order that, so that he can avoid hearing the gospel. And for him, I go, I don't care about politics, Mario. I don't care whether you're an Obama fan or a Trump fan. They're all going to fail us. Our salvation is not found in politics. Now, granted, run with that where we are, but I will not allow him to define me that way and to give him an excuse, I told him, I said, you're trying to put me in a box so that you can excuse when I tell you that Jesus said, unless you repent, you're going to perish. And he was silent. God calls different people to different spheres of influence and ministry. Isn't that great? I do not feel led to go down and be a street evangelist. Bob? <laughs> now, Bob... I'm not, if he judges me and says I lack boldness or whatever, shame on him. But he hasn't. Right? Not to your face. Not to my face. <laughs> and in the same way, because he can't spell, I don't judge him. <laughs> what we see here is Paul says, look, God called me to the Gentiles. God's called Peter to the Jews. That's great. Everybody has their own sphere. Everybody has their own gifting. That's awesome. We are here on the same team. At the end of the day, I've told Bob, you catch him, I'll clean him. <laughs> Seems like fair. He's better at it than that. You know, he goes out there, and I think, oh, man. And we, we, we should be like, man, I'm glad that God has gifted certain people. Now, granted, that doesn't mean we stay silent. We're still doing the work of an evangelist and speak our mind. But we also recognize those who have a stronger level of gifting. And Paul said the same thing. Look, I'm not getting involved in this. Peter's to the Jews, and I'm to the Gentiles, even though Peter, or Paul could have said, I'm probably better equipped to reach the Jewish people because I was a Pharisee. But he didn't. He said, interesting, God has called me to the Gentiles. I accept it. I'm going to run with it. The gospel, number seven, brings unity between different groups. What's fascinating to me, I'll end it here. And Paul says to the Galatians, hey, there's these, these, um, these Judaizers, these false brethren are coming in. And, and it's very clear they're saying Jesus plus something. But there's also, Jesus gives a parable in Matthew 13 about the wheat and the tares. And he, he gives a parable and says, The kingdom of heaven is, is, is like a man who planted good seed in his field. But an enemy came in and planted bad seed. So when you walk out there, as they first started, all you see is this green shoot coming up. And then they say, Oh, Lord. Do you want us to go out and rip up all the bad seeds? And the owner says, no. If you try to do that now, you might tear up some good ones along with the bad ones. At the end of the age, God is going to send forth his angels and he'll be the one that's doing the separating. And that's humility for us. That when we look out, yes, we should protect each other and we should protect the gospel and all that. But sometimes you look out and you see somebody and you go, are they a false brother? Oh, maybe I need to root them out. And Jesus is saying, that's not your job. Unless it's totally overt. Because sometimes you might uproot somebody that's true. They just have some false thinking. And we need to educate them. But you come out with full force and you, and you beat someone and you root them out and you kick them out. 
That lacks compassion and humility where God is the one that does that. If you stand, we'll pray. Father in heaven, as we come this morning, there's a lot here for sure. And, and honestly, we could have gone twice as long in the sense of getting to the root of some of this. But I pray that, that these truths that are out there, this consistency that's found throughout the New Covenant Scripture, the New Testament, pray, Lord, that you would continue to remind us of the awesomeness, the ministry of life that the New Covenant brings us. That we are saved by grace for our faith in Jesus alone. That any other system of faith on something is not of you. And Lord, it gives me tremendous comfort to know that when I'm not obedient and when I screw up, I can come and to confess my sins to you and that you are faithful to cleanse my sin and to forgive me. And I can take rest in what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. As I do seek to obey, it's good to be obedient. But my salvation is not based on that. Help us, Lord, to be tenacious about your gospel as Paul was here. That we continue to stand strong in the midst of continuing pressure for us to compromise. This is the only message of salvation that the world has. is faith and trust in Jesus alone. We love the Lord because you first love God. Help us to continue to live on Thank you guys. We'll see you next week.